When I began the process, I just didn't like the regulations because I thought, well, they're kind of nebulous and they don't make a lot of sense. And when we started investigating, what we found is that the plan is really very organized and very well put together. The plan is to move education away from what we have right now, which is traditional education. That's you have so many Carnegie units, you had four classes of math and four classes of English and so many classes of history to graduate, to what is called outcome-based education. Outcome-based education says that the, the student must demonstrate something in order to meet the goal and be promoted or graduate. In the traditional system, said this is an A, this is a B, this is a C, this is a D, this is an E, and you fit wherever you fit. Now you had so much time in order to do that, so you know you had 180 days, and then the achievement went up or down according to that. In outcome-based education, the, the theory is everybody gets an A or everybody gets a B, and however long it takes you to get there is okay. If you can get there in three days, then you graduate in three days. If it takes you ten years then you graduate in 10 years. Everything rides on the goals and on meeting the goals. So instead of saying the schools will teach, the theory now is the student will demonstrate. And so it's a major shift in the way we look at education. In order to understand that, I want you to think of a telephone salesman. Have you ever gotten a, call, a telephone call from a telephone salesman? You pick up the phone and the salesman says, hi, um, he asks you three or four questions. I'm selling purple shoes tonight, so I want to know, are you a shoe owner? And you say yes or no. And I say, do you like the color purple? And you say yes or no. Uh, do you buy your own shoes, or does your husband buy your shoes, or your wife buy your shoes, or your children buy your shoes, or does some other person buy your shoes for you? And you say yes or no. That's my pretest. I have just established the baseline data. Now I know where you are, so I can begin teaching you about why you need purple shoes. That's the pretest. Now that I've established that, I'm going to do my sales pitch, and I'm going to give you 10 reasons why you really, really need purple shoes, and you're going to, you can't live without them, and you want them. That's the curriculum. I have taught you something. I'm done now. Would you like to put that, Mrs. Smith, on your visa or on your MasterCard? That's the post-test. I am assessing you to see if you have met my goal or not. My goal is that you're going to buy my shoes. You say, put it on my visa. You have met the goal. I'm going to say thank you very much, and you may graduate from this conversation, and I'm going to hang up. You say, no, you have not met the goal. I am going to say, um, well, why not? What is your objection? And you're going to tell me, and I am going to remediate you. I'm going to put you through another sales pitch to make you want my purple shoes. That's remediation. You're going to walk that loop with me one more time and at the end of the remediation I'm going to say, should I put this on your visa or your MasterCard? I'm testing you again. That's a reassessment. If you say, yes, you have met the goal, you may graduate from the conversation and I'm going to hang up. If you say, no, I'm going to say, what is your objection? And I'm going to remediate you again and test you again. Now, if you would stay on the phone indefinitely, I would keep making you walk that remediation loop until you finally said, yes, you're going to buy my shoes, until you meet the goal. However, in a telephone sales call, you can say, excuse me, I've been remediated enough, I'm never meeting your goal, and you can hang up the phone. A child in a classroom cannot hang up the phone. They are going to be remediated again and again and again and again until they meet the goal. That's outcome-based education. Everything rests on the goal. That's the ladder that everything rests on. So when I started getting involved way back in the fall, I looked at the goal because that's what everything rests on. I thought I'd find geography, history, spelling, reading. I found adaptability to change, ethical judgment, self-esteem, family living, proper environmental attitudes, understanding and appreciating others. And I went and met with Mr. Fear, who's the executive director of the State Board of Education in Pennsylvania, and I said, where did you get these? And with every goal, there was a list of exit outcomes. That's the specific behaviors that the child has to demonstrate in order to prove that they met the goal. The child just can't say, I met the goal, I understand others, isn't that great? The child has a list of behaviors that they have to demonstrate in order to prove that they met the goal. So I said to Mr. Fear, well, 
where'd you get the gold? And where did you get these, these exit outcomes? Where did they come from? And he said, oh, we had committees meet all over the state. And we brought together teachers and parents and, and other groups, and we got together and had consensus forming, and we reevaluated them and redid them, and they came up with over 500 student learning outcomes. And I said, well, okay, what did they base it on? He said, oh, nothing. We developed these specifically for Pennsylvania. I said, well, you mean when they went in and sat down, the table was empty? Oh, no, no. I said, well, what was on the table? Connecticut's goal. Oh, okay. So I wrote to Connecticut and said to Connecticut, would you please send me your goals? And Connecticut did send me their goals. And I sat down, and Connecticut's goals and Pennsylvania's goals were the same goals, word for word, the same goals. Since then, we've gotten the goals from 26 different states. And this just gives you a little overview of what some of those exit outcomes are and how close they were. All students understand and appreciate their worth as unique and capable individuals and exhibit self-esteem. That's Pennsylvania's. Connecticut. Each student should be able to appreciate his or her worth as a unique and capable individual and exhibit self-esteem. Does that sound familiar? You can take all the student learning outcomes and match them up. It doesn't matter what state you're in. It doesn't matter whose outcomes you're looking at. If you strip the names of the states, you can't tell whose are whose. Now, the other states, they passed their goals and their exit outcomes on the first go-around. Pennsylvania, because of the involvement of parents like you and me and other ones across the state, have been forced to rewrite their student learning outcomes seven times now. Some of these are from the first set that began, was first published in September. They published another set on March the 11th. That set included student learning outcomes that said that our children would exhibit the proper attitudes to live in the American constitutional democracy. We don't have a constitutional democracy. We have a democratic republic. The State Board of Education got the form of government wrong. So I went on the radio in Harrisburg and said, the State Board of Education doesn't know what their government is, much less what attitudes you need to live in it. So they rewrote those learning outcomes on March the 12th. That set lasted 24 hours. They're in their seventh rewrite now of student learning outcomes, and really, they haven't changed a bit. They've combined some, they've rearranged some, they've reorganized some, but the exit outcomes are still the same. Now, when you move to outcome-based education, there's a couple questions that you always have to ask. Because every child must demonstrate the goal, that means that, first of all, someone has to set a standard for what is mastery of this goal. How good is good enough? How much self-esteem is enough self-esteem? How much adaptability to change is too much adaptability to change? So first, we have to set a standard. Second, I have to test you in some way. I have to do an assessment to find out if you met my standard. Third, I have to remediate you. If you don't meet the standard, I have to bring in a curriculum or an activity or a program that will in some way change your behavior to make you meet my standard. Now, when you look at Pennsylvania's goals, we ask, what standards do you set? How do you test? How do you remediate? The state's response was, well, we're not real sure about that. So we went looking to see, well, what are you doing right now? Well, right now, Pennsylvania gives a test uh, and has for, since the 1960s. It was called the Educational Quality Assessment, or the EQA. It was given all the way up until 1989 when it was finally pulled. Each district took the EQA. It was given in grades 5, 8, and 11. Districts were required to write their long-range plan from the results of the EQA test, the Educational Quality Assessment Test. In that plan, each district had to say how they were going to change their curriculum in order to make the children do better on that assessment the next time. Now, if you think about it, that makes sense. You know, if, if you give the same test in every district, and I give it in your district and your district and your district, and you were first and you were second, but I'm sorry, you were last, what are you going to do? You're going to change your curriculum so you're not last anymore because that's embarrassing. So the EQA was the basis for curriculum planning for all the districts in the state. And it was a mandatory test. The districts had to take it because they had to base their long-range plan on it in order to get their state money. What did the EQA test? The EQA tested first the 10, then the 12 quality goals of education. When we looked at the EQA, parents thought it was testing reading, writing, self-esteem, citizenship. It tested locus of control, whether you are an internally motivated person 
or an externally motivated person, whether you stand up against a crowd or whether you go with the flow. And they scored it. There was a right answer to the attitude question. The right answer was go with the flow. In citizenship, the EQA said it did not test anything in the factual domain. It didn't matter if you knew what the United Nations was. It didn't matter if you knew who the president was or what a president was. Citizenship tested thresholds of behavior. How do I vary reward and punishment to make you do what I want you to do? Sample question. There was an organization called the Midnight Marauders. They went out at midnight and spray painted all over everybody's walls. I would join the group if, A, my best friend were a member of the group. The child could say yes, no, or maybe. The correct answer was yes. I would join the group if all the popular kids were members of the group, yes, no, or maybe. The correct answer was yes. I would join the group if my parents would ground me if they found out. The correct answer was no. You are supposed to avoid punishment, but you are supposed to honor commitments to friends and go with the group. The goal was collectivism. The EQA tested for adaptability to change. What parents were told was, well, you know, our world is constantly changing and we want people who are going to be able to go with that and, and survive that. We don't want rigid people who are, can't cope. Sounds very reasonable. The EQA tested and scored for rapid emotional adjustment to change without protest. That was the state desired response. The EQA just didn't test the attitudes of children. It scored the attitudes of children. It was a criterion reference test. That means there's a right answer and a wrong answer. And I say what it is. The bottom criteria for the EQA was that students would exhibit what the state called a minimum positive attitude. The 11th grade EQA was written, written on a reading level between 5th and 8th grade. The EQA out of over 400 questions, 30 of them were academic and 385 of them were attitudes. When the district took the EQA, they got back a list from the state of where they fit with other districts in the goal. They had to write their long-range plan in order to change their curriculum to have their children achieve the minimum positive attitude. Well, how did they do that? What did they change? The state said, we'll help you. And they brought in technical assistance, either in person or in what were called resources for improvement packets that the state made available to the district. Those packets included lists of what were called validated programs. Those are programs from all over the country that had been tested by the federal government and had been proven to change the behaviors and attitudes of children in a specific subgroup. All, um, white male children with two parents who make less than $20,000 a year. All black female children in a single parent family who make more than $50,000 a year. They could divide the children up into what were called targeted subgroups based on your race, on gender, on ability level, on education of the parents, on socioeconomic status. And the programs were tested and then declared validated, meaning that they were proven to work to change the behaviors and attitudes of children in that subgroup. And that's what has been happening in Pennsylvania education since the 1960s. Our curriculum has been moving away from academics and into minimum positive attitude since the EQA. And the EQA is still driving the curriculum because districts used it for long range planning up till 1989. Why did they stop? They stopped because a mother down in Washington County named Anita Hogue had a son who took the EQA. He came home and said, Mom, this test was really weird. She said, you must be wrong. I'm going to go down to the school and look. And she went down to the school and she said, I, I want to see the test. And they said, no. And she said, no, see, I'm the mommy. I'm allowed to see the test. And they said, no, you're not. It's a secure test. Nobody's allowed to see it. Big fine if you see it. Mrs. Hogue um, is the type of person that when you say no, she flunked locus of control, you know, made her want to do it more. So she wound up writing to the state and finally got a copy of the test and the scoring, which is how we got it. 
she filed a complaint with the Federal Department of Education alleging that the EQA was a violation of the Federal Hatch Act, federal law, that it was violating her rights to privacy and uh, it was against the psychological testing portion of that law and the federal government agreed with her and said the EQA was a psychological test, it was in violation of law, and Pennsylvania had to enter into a consent agreement with the federal government, which resulted in policy being issued by our department, saying they wouldn't do it anymore. So what did Pennsylvania do with the consent agreement? Well, in 1988, when Mrs. Hoke's complaint began to surface, then Commissioner of Education Donna Wall issued a memo saying, uh, we're going to withdraw the EQA until we incorporate it into the new Pennsylvania assessment system. In 1990, the Pennsylvania assessment system was first piloted. The first assessment was called the Pennsylvania Health Assessment. It says right on it, this is the revision of the EQA. This year, the Pennsylvania assessment system tested reading, math, and writing. Is it the same test? It has a different name but their own documents say the computer needs to be able to access where your child can discrepancy between the two plans. If the school board doesn't like what the team said,